Hello and welcome to the online service of the Ipswich and East United Reformed Churches. Whatever your situation is, or whoever you're with, or perhaps you're alone, we come all together and worship God this day. We begin with a sentence from Scripture from Psalm 107, just one verse, and then we pause, reflect, and give this time to our God. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's join together in prayer. Loving God, like a mother you enfold us in your care, like a hen you gather us as chicks under its wings. You never forget us. You never forsake us. You are utterly dependable. We come with hymns and spiritual songs to offer our praise and our prayers. Take our worship, take this time we have set aside, for you have set aside even up to your Son. Help us to worship you today. Amen.
and in a prayer of confession there is a response after the phrase eternal God if we say together in your mercy forgive us let's pray God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, shared in the life of an earthly home, we confess to you our sin. We have not treated one another with love and respect. We have put ourselves first and been inconsiderate. Eternal God, in your mercy, forgive us. We have not treated one another with kindness and compassion. We have been quick to take offence and slow to forgive. Eternal God, in your mercy, forgive us. We have not given to you the honour and praise you deserve. We have been foolish and disobedient and wandered far from you. Eternal God, in your mercy, forgive us. God, give us compassion, kindness and humility, patience, meekness and gentleness, that we may be clothed with that love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Friends, through Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins, in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature, children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, 
who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace, in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, to be our way of life. Not long ago, there was a survey among Christians asking what their most popular Bible verse was. And, perhaps it's unsurprising, it was John 3.16. For God so loved the world. I was thinking about that verse and wondering just how great God's love is and if we could measure it. So today I've brought us several things that we often use to measure stuff, and I thought it might help us explaining something about God's love. Sometimes we measure ingredients, and I make bread. So I need two things. I need uh, a scale to uh, find out how much stuff is going on there with weights and how much there, and also I need a, um, a jug, a measuring cup. I put the especially the uh, wet, um, in case bread's case, it's um, half a litre of water um, I need to put into my bread. Uh, and I put that in there. I use it to make bread, and out it comes three hours later. Well, I don't need my own bread. I'll put it in a bread machine. But is that enough? I wonder if we can use a measuring cup to... Uh, Find out about how much God loves us. Well, the Bible does say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Want My cup runs over. Well, if our cup runs over with God's love, I guess we couldn't use this to measure God's love. If I was uh, doing some repairs or doing some woodwork or building a house, though that's outside of my skill set, we would need to measure things in various ways. And perhaps uh, the most easy to recognize is this a tape measure. We can uh, decide how long something is or how high something is or how uh, and mark it off exactly where we need to cut a piece of uh, wood or whatever it might be. The Bible tells us God's love is higher than the heavens and deeper than the deepest sea. I don't think we could measure God's love with a tape measure. Well, there's another thing we measure time, and that's this. This is uh, my Fitbit, my watch, and it surprisingly tells time. It also tells how many steps I do each day, and it gives me uh, how many beats per minute my heart rate is. It measures all sorts of things these days. A simple watch, well, they're not so simple these days. The Bible tells us that God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. It can't be quantified in distance or in time. So if God's love is from everlasting to everlasting, we can't use a watch to measure how much God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Isn't that an amazing amount of love? How do you measure love like that? Well, we can't. We don't need to, but we do need to experience it. And I guess as we look at the passage from uh, John chapter 3 in just a few seconds, we need to perhaps reflect on another reading from Ephesians 3. 
that you may understand how wide and long and how high and how deep his love really is. May you experience it, though it is so great, you will never fully understand it. The Gospel reading is taken from John, chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true, come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
as we have listened to God's word, uh, let, let God's word dwell in us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are with us. And as we have heard, help us to also experience your living word, Jesus Christ, in us at this very moment. Take the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts and make them acceptable in your sight. I guess since the financial crash of 2008 and the austerity it ushered in, compounded by the huge dislocation of COVID since 2020, and more recently the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is in 2020, over two years ago, and in the last five months, the Hamas raid on Israel and Israel's devastating retaliation on the people of Gaza. Many of us have been left bewildered and fearful for the future. On top of that, just a few days ago, it was confirmed that the February global temperature was the highest on record and 1.77 degrees warmer than pre-industrial average. That may not sound like very much, but that's a huge change. And on the extremes, it means there's a droughts and floods and weather and climate is changing massively. Desperate to survive, we sacrifice, sacrifice our time, energy and well-being to attempt to maintain a grip of the things that have sustained us in the past. A massively resourced advertising industry constantly assures us that frantic schedules and rampant consumerism are virtues to be admired and cultivated. And yet, and yet, a still small voice from somewhere continues to disturb us with its persistent whispers that we are strangling our bodies, our spirits, our communities, and our planet. But without being able to get our heads around the enormity of the dangers or see a way clear of them, we numb ourselves against the anxiety and run ever harder. A few decades ago, most people in the West could confidently look forward to an increasingly affluent lifestyle in an endlessly growing national economy. But today we know that even if the knowledge is constantly repressed, that these personal and national aspirations are actually doing horrendous violence to our mental and spiritual health, our intimate relationships, and even to the ecosystems on which we depend for our air, food, and water. But most of us have no concept of a genuine alternative, and so we plough ahead on the same path in the hope that those things that we do will make life worthwhile. The widespread nagging dissatisfaction is the repressed knowledge that it won't. And the chronic patterns of social, relational and personal breakdown we are seeing are a consequence of this repressed anxiety. In our gospel reading, we heard Jesus say that God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, and that those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. It is important to get our heads around that if we are to make sense of the good news. For it does not say that those who do not believe are condemned for not believing. It says that those who do not believe are condemned already. And it does not say that they are condemned by God. It says that they are condemned 
already. And when we hold the, that idea up against the nightmare summit scenario of a world seemingly hell-bent on its own destruction, I think it starts to make a bit of sense. As the Apostle Paul put it in our reading from Ephesians, simply following the course of this world is a recipe for death. A very common misunderstanding of the gospel is that, the self, is that salvation is about doing what we need to do to stop being God being angry with us and wanting to destroy us. The forces that are seeking to destroy us, though, are not initiatives of God. They are, mostly, of our own making. They understandably feel much bigger than just being of our own making because they have taken on a life of their own and become a massive, seemingly unstoppable cultural black hole. A great darkness sucking everything into itself. But as huge as that may be, it is not God. And it is not something that God casts us into as a punishment for something. Rather, it is the crisis from which God wants to save us. And God is always ready and longing to save us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. That is to say, God's love for the world is so overwhelming that even giving up his own son was not too great a cost to ensure that no one need succumb to death. All those who put their trust in him can have a boundless life instead. That is not the story of a God who is ready to condemn us, to cast us into hell if we don't get it right. God is overwhelmingly motivated by love for us. The kind of love that will risk plunging into that black hole to try to pull us out, even if it means dying in the attempt. We do not have the kind of lunatic God who both creates the black hole in a fit of anger and condemnation and tries to pull us out of it at the same time. If God does nothing, we are all condemned. Not condemned by God, but condemned to death, a living death in a hell of our own making. A hell of spiralling darkness, of quiet desperation, fear, depression and self-destruction. But the good news is that God does not do nothing. Consumed by love for us, God plunges in in order to save us, to rescue us, to bring us safely home. And there is nothing we can do to earn God's endeavours to save us and nothing we can do to make God stop trying. As Paul says, by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. It's a gift. God does not have a checklist of those worth saving and those God is happy to abandon to their fate. That might seem like bad news if you are hoping that God sees you as more worthy of saving than some murderer or child molester. But it will be good news if you realise that God sees you every bit as much as worth saving as Mother Teresa or Desmond Tutu or whoever. God just sees us in desperate need, no distinction at all, and plunges into the vortex of darkness 
to rescue whoever can be saved. But then there is another common conception about salvation, about the nature of God's rescue mission. Too commonly we imagine salvation as some sort of individual registration process. We make contact with Jesus, say we, what he wants us to hear, he wants us to, wants to hear in some formula, and get our names transferred onto the list of the saved, the book of life. But all we've done is make ourselves feel a bit better by signing up for some kind of cosmic insurance policy that says that we can hold a little candle while we are sucked into a black hole. And when we finally get dragged under and die, there will be some So Jesus comes to us, reaching out to us and calling us into the light. But as Jesus said in our reading, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light. Most of us are caught not really wanting to leave the darkness. It might be killing us where we are, but we become rather attached to its familiarity, its comforts, and its company. And all we really want is for Jesus to hand us a little candle so that we can have our own little bit of light to help us cope with the desperate plunge into the black hole. A little bit of light as a kind of palliative care painkiller as we succumb. But Jesus is not the least bit interested in helping us cope with the darkness. Jesus is calling us into the light, seeking to rescue us from the darkness entirely. But most of us are still fearful of the light. It is too weird, too countercultural, too nonconformist. And we are too addicted to the ways of our past. We keep hoping for a little light to shine in the, our darkness rather than a radical relocation into the light. This is not just an individual story, though. It's also the story of our society. We know that wars only create more wars, but we keep on fighting them. We know that burning fossil fuels is suffocating us, but we keep digging them up and burning them. We know that the modern dream of every family with their own house full of every kind of possible consumer appliance is strangling our world and destroying our souls, but we keep running ever harder on the treadmill to keep up. God is not hating us for it, or wanting to punish us or condemn us, but condemned we already are if we will not take the way into the light that Jesus keeps calling us into. And here I'm struggling to know how to finish this sermon, because I'm just as caught up in it as everyone else, and I long for the light but find myself as often as not clinging to my comfortable bit of darkness and numbing myself to the obvious. And we as a church are called to be people of light, one of the great pools of light into which people can step and be saved from the darkness. But the truth is that we, like most churches, are struggling to find any meaningful way of creating the support systems by which we can help one another stand true 
and not slide into this black hole. I don't know how to put the answers into practice. All I do know is that it is only as we fall to our knees in prayer and hold our hands to one another to give and receive the bread and the wine, which are the light of the world that we have got any chance to find the way of living in the light together. For God so loves the world that the light has come into the world and all who put their trust in the light will be saved and have life in abundance, boundless, unquenchable life. Is that what you want today? Amen. As we pray together after the phrase, in your mercy, say out loud or in your heart, save us. In your mercy, save us. Let's pray. Merciful God, the consequences of human sin and folly are terrible to contemplate. But we bring them to you in prayer, seeking salvation for the world for humankind and for ourselves. We pray for our world, devastated and destroyed by greed and lack of foresight. Earth rendered barren, water made toxic, species wiped out. Creator God, we pray for your world, in your mercy, save us. 
we pray for humankind, dehumanized and divided by, by selfishness and ignorance, children weak from hunger, women exploited and downtrodden, men misshapen by competition and war. Saviour God, we pray for humankind. In your mercy, save us. We pray for ourselves, damaged and distorted by lack of love or understanding, slow to trust in you, weakened by guilt, afraid to love wholeheartedly. Spirit of God, we pray for ourselves. In your mercy, save us. We pray for the hurting and the bereaved, those who are isolated and lonely, the many who are afraid of stranger and friend, afraid to love wholeheartedly. Spirit of God, we pray for the hurting and bereaved. In your mercy, save us. We pray for your church around the world in this country and the congregation that we would normally attend that we would learn to serve each other and ourselves, that we would discern the right path in going forward in our church's life, that we would serve those around us. Spirit of God, we pray for your church. In your mercy, save us. We pray for others, and in a time of silence, we pray our prayers to you, O Lord. We pray for ourselves. In your mercy, save us. Amen. And friends, as we come to the end of our service, sing with me again out loud, if that's possible for you or in your heart, if you're in a place where there's other people. Uh, let's sing our final hymn together.
Friends, go now and live as people made by God for good works. Live your life in God openly in the light, so all may see. Celebrate God's love with a sacrifice of praise and tell your story of salvation with joy to all who will hear. And may God show you the immeasurable riches of his grace. May Christ lead you into the life prepared for you. And may the Spirit gift you with faith for salvation. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.